Let's talk mitochondrial DNA. Okay, but for real. Did you know some species have linear chromosomes in their mitochondria instead of the circular ones we're used to seeing in diagrams? And some species even have a separate chromosome for each gene. We've all heard that mitochondrial DNA is passed down through the mother, right? Well, actually, we found some instances of paternal transmission in multiple species, including humans. And if that wasn't crazy enough, what if I told you that the mitochondrial genome is shrinking? And it's actually been doing so basically its entire existence. I mean, the genes are not just disappearing, they're also moving. Like, the gene is picking up and moving somewhere else, to the nucleus. Which, like, how does it get there? And for what reason? I mean, it already has a home. Why move? And also, there's an animal who's taking this to an extreme. It no longer has any DNA left in its mitochondria, but we'll get to that later. So first, let's review. Why does the mitochondria have a genome in the first place? So you may be familiar with the endosymbiosis theory. This idea that chloroplasts and mitochondria were once free living bacteria that got swallowed by another organism and are now no longer independent entities, but instead are organelles in every eukaryotic cell. Well, okay, only plants and algae have chloroplasts. However, all eukaryotes have mitochondria. So plants and algae have mitochondria too. Several lines of evidence led scientists to this theory. For example, these organelles look like bacteria. They have their own genomes, they have their own membranes, and to make new chloroplasts and mitochondria, they divide into two, like bacteria. So yeah, they have their own DNA, their own genome, which we had said before is slowly shrinking over time. The actual number of base pairs varies widely between species. However, the number of actual genes is pretty consistent across animals. It's 37 genes. 13 of which encode for proteins. And to put this in perspective, the likely bacterial ancestor to the mitochondria has 6,000 genes. So some of these genes were lost and some went to the nucleus. For example, in humans, to make everything necessary for the mitochondria, it would require 3,000 genes. And only 37 of these are in the mitochondria. So you can see there's an extensive transfer of genes to the nucleus, a sort of transfer of command to the main control center. And these migrations have happened independently multiple times in multiple lineages. So these genes seem to want to go to the nucleus. Why? One benefit of going to the nucleus is that these genes have a chance for recombination through sexual reproduction whereas these organelles reproduce essentially asexually by dividing into two, which allows for bad mutations to accumulate instead of being weeded out. So that doesn't fully explain everything, but yeah. Okay, so if the gene leaves the mitochondria, how does it get to the nucleus? I mean, the mitochondria has a membrane itself, the cytoplasm is a really crowded place, and then even once the DNA gets to the nucleus, it somehow needs to get inside. So we don't fully understand how this works, but there's three ideas. One is actual lysis of the organelle. So for example, the mitochondria gets demolished and then leaves its DNA freely floating in the cytoplasm. 
which then somehow finds its way to the nucleus and makes it inside. Another idea is that there could be fusion between the mitochondrial membrane and the nuclear membrane that allows the DNA to just freely pass between. And wildly enough, the third idea could be that the mitochondria themselves, like whole mitochondria, can just go inside the nucleus. So more than one study has found whole mitochondria inside nuclei. So if the gene goes to the nucleus, and this gene encodes for a protein that belongs in the mitochondria, how does the protein get back to the mitochondria? Well, that's actually not the most difficult part. One study showed that using random sequences derived from E. coli DNA, that one in 30 of these sequences would create molecular tags that allow proteins to go to the mitochondria. Which, this is crazy, right? Because bacteria don't have mitochondria. Because mitochondria were once bacteria. So what is the hard part about being a protein that is needed in the mitochondria but having your gene in the nucleus? Well, we just said that it wasn't having the correct signal to go back to the mitochondria because apparently that's not that hard to do. Instead, the barrier is actually having that gene be expressed. How does the machinery, DNA polymerase, that will transcribe the gene into its blueprint, how does that machinery recognize this novel gene? Because this process of gene expression, transcription, is an intricate and complex series of events with transcription factors and binding sites and promoters and the whole deal, how does some random chunk of DNA from the mitochondria just come into the nucleus, integrate into the DNA already there, and then just get expressed? That is a great question. Okay, so remember how like literally two seconds ago, I just said, how does the protein get back to the mitochondria? Well, it doesn't always go back there, which is crazy. It's a gene that was once in the mitochondria's genome that used to get expressed by a polymerase that is exclusively in the mitochondria that gets translated by ribosomes that reside in the mitochondria to make a protein that stays in the mitochondria. So now I'm telling you that that gene, yes, that one, goes to the nucleus and over time gets made into a protein that then goes somewhere else sometimes even goes to the chloroplast. So is this a one-time occurrence? The gene goes to the nucleus, finds a new home, and the migration is done. Well, no. And apparently this happens quite frequently. And it doesn't just have to be gene genes. It can also be non-genic DNA. So the regions in between genes. And it can even be the entire mitochondrial genome just straight up in the chromosome. So DNA is being transferred between organelles, with DNA going from the mitochondria to the nucleus, or from chloroplast to the nucleus, or chloroplast DNA to the mitochondria, or even nuclear DNA to the mitochondria. However, transfer from the nucleus to the organelle is way less common, like a hundred thousand times less likely to occur. So an organism swallowed an alpha proteobacteria, which then gave rise to the last common ancestor of all eukaryotes. And then this happened again, when an organism then swallowed a cyanobacteria and then gave rise to algae and plants. So it already happened twice. Does that mean it could happen again? I mean, it's happened more than twice. And yeah, it's, it's probably happening right now. There have been many cases of secondary endosymbiosis. For example, brown kelp, which is a eukaryote. So it swallowed a bacteria that then became a mitochondria. And then it also swallowed an algae, which had already swallowed a chloroplast 
and the mitochondria. And also this mealy bug, which is a eukaryote, so it has a mitochondria, and then it swallowed a bacteria, which had itself swallowed a bacteria. Okay, so now let's go back to the beginning with that extreme example of an animal that has lost its mitochondrial DNA completely. Now granted, lots of species have lost their mitochondrial DNA. However, H. salmonicola was the first example of an animal, a multicellular organism to do so. Whereas all the other previous examples have been unicellular protists, which protists is just like an umbrella term for eukaryotes that don't fit into our other categories. So the mitochondria makes us rethink relationships. What will we think about our classifications in the future? How will things change as life merges and separates? What will be distinguishable and what will be lost? Thanks for watching.